Dr. Richard Harris is joining us today. Dr. Harris, thank you so much for being here with us. I'm excited to get to talk to you because I've been following you for a while on social media. I love what you're doing. As a doctor, you're really thinking outside the box. What kind of practice do you have here in Houston? Yeah, so my practice is not very traditional. I focus mostly on mindset and lifestyle medicine. And I'm very selective on who I'll work with because really the body has a wonderful capacity to heal itself. But we have to put ourselves in the right state, both mentally and physically, emotionally as well, for that to happen. And I really want to work with people who are willing to invest in themselves. Wasn't it Hippocrates, Hippocrates that said, before you heal someone, you must first ask them if they're willing to give up what made them sick in the first place? Yeah, it's so true, because we're really good at hurting and harming ourselves by doing things that we think are helping ourselves. Okay, well, we're here today to talk about vitamin D, mm -hmm. such an important hormone. I think a lot of people forget that it's a hormone and one hormone affects all other hormones in our body, correct? It is. Hormones have such a powerful effect. We tend to think of one cause, one effect, right? That's how our brains work. But when you look at hormones, these things have effects all over the place. In fact, I think vitamin D interacts with over 1200 different points in our genes and it controls things from brain health to cardiometabolic health and metabolism to thyroid health to calcium levels to immune system and so it's involved with numerous aspects of our daily functioning and unfortunately it was misnamed as a vitamin because mm -hmm. people hear vitamin they're like eh, whatever i start talking about hormones testosterone estrogen progesterone everybody's face lights up and people tune in because they know how powerful hormones are. Vitamin D is a very powerful hormone. Well, and even for bone health as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely important for, for bone health and, and calcium regulation. All right. Let's talk about some of the symptoms of low vitamin D. And you know, this, this, this conversation really got stirred up again with COVID because so many people started looking back to vitamin D and the supplements and what have you. But let's talk about some of the, the symptoms that you see of people that come into your clinic, into your practice with low vitamin D, because it's common. It's extraordinarily common. So if you look at the data, overall, about 42% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. That number goes up to 64% in the Hispanic community. And a astounding 84% in the African American community. And people may ask, why is that? Sun exposure. The darker your skin, the more sun exposure you need to make vitamin D because the process of making vitamin D starts from converting a cholesterol metabolite in our skin when our skin is exposed to UV light from sunlight. And so if you're not getting enough sun exposure, your vitamin D levels are going to be low. So one of the things that I'll see when people come in and the symptoms aren't specific, it's not like you get one specific symptom, boom, vitamin D deficiency, right? It's mm -hmm. more nonspecific. It might be fatigue. You might see elevated cholesterol levels. You might see elevated blood sugars. You might see low testosterone. You might see some slight thyroid abnormalities. So those are the lab works that you might see. You might see abnormalities in calcium. Some of the other things as far as presentation is people will present with fatigue, people will present with brain fog, people who repeatedly get upper respiratory tract infections because a lot of the data on vitamin D as far as the whole total body of work comes from respiratory infections. And we know that people with low vitamin D get more upper respiratory tract infections. So people who frequently get colds all the time, I'll, I'll see that. People who have brittle bones, people who have osteoporosis because it is involved with bone metabolism. So those are some of the things you'll see. Sometimes people get joint pains, frequent just random joint pains from low vitamin D. And so whenever I see these things, I kind of perk up and I'm like, we should probably check a vitamin D level, which given today's health status, most people are coming with one of these symptoms. And so I'm checking vitamin D's on almost everybody. And there's a lot of ailments out there from cancer to mental decline, things like that, that all go back to vitamin D too. You can see, if you look at the literature and look at associations, all right, we're not talking causation. You know, there's a difference between correlation, which something is associated with something in causation. 
And the hard part about things like this is it's really hard to prove causation because these hormones all work with each other, mm -hmm. right? So it's really hard to say, oh, this conclusively is a fat, is vitamin D, but could vitamin D be playing a role? Absolutely. So it is really important to think about that whenever you're thinking about overall systemic dysfunction and checking something important like you would other hormones. And it's so simple. It's simple to check. It's simple to supplement. It's simple to get outside and getting outside has other benefits as well. So that's the good news with all this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, use a simple metric when I talk to people. How much time intentionally do you spend outside per day? And the answer to that question is a really good microcosm for people's overall health. Because people who are very healthy spend intentional time outdoors, partially for vitamin D, but partially for all the other benefits. If you live close to green space, your cardiovascular disease risk is lower. You have improvement in, in mental health scores, uh, blood pressure from nitric oxide is made when we're outside in sunlight. So people have reductions in blood pressure, people mood feel elevated, sunlight is energy, and you're literally getting positive energy. I know that sounds a little bit esoteric, but it's a form of energy transference when you're out in the sunlight. Oh, no, I, I know that for sure. I lived and worked for a, a little bit of time in Minneapolis. And during the winter there, I mean, you literally go days and weeks without seeing the sun when it's super hazy and overcast there. And I, I mean, it, it, it starts to feel depressing to you, or it did to me anyway. And I know a lot of people deal with that seasonal affective type disorder. And I'm sure vitamin D plays into that as well. It does. And so depending on where you are in the country, depends on when your vitamin D levels will naturally start to decline. So if you're in a certain latitude, let's just say Boston, I think it's between something like October and March, something like that, you don't make any vitamin D, even if you're getting out in the sun. Because the, the way that the sun is hitting the earth, the angles, the UV light is not strong enough to stimulate vitamin D synthesis. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the reasons why you see some seasonal variations in mood, seasonal variations in appetite intake. People tend to eat more in the winter months you see disruption in all kinds of circadian rhythm things. And one of them can be the synthesis of, of vitamin D. So a lot of people may have to supplement higher levels of vitamin D or get more sunlight in certain locations when they are in the wintertime. Let's talk about the supplements. What, what do you recommend as far as dosage and how often you should take it and who should take it? Yeah, the good thing about vitamin D is that it's really, really hard hard to overdose. And it's something that we can easily check. We can check to see if you're taking too much. And how do we know you're taking too much? Number one, your calcium levels will elevate because vitamin D, one of its main roles is to increase the amount of calcium we pull from our stomachs when we eat food. You can also see another hormone called PTH. PTH, what it does is kind of a little bit of the opposite of vitamin D. When PTH goes up, we start pulling vitamin D from our pulling calcium from our bones. So you can start to see changes in PTH levels. And then you can monitor vitamin D itself. So if your vitamin D level is like 120, no one needs a vitamin D level that high. So then I'm going to tell people to come down on your supplementation. Most people will do okay with between 1000 to 2000 international units per day. Now you could do that once a week, take that same amount once a week, that's fine. Or you can do it daily. Some people, especially the people, like I mentioned earlier, people who have darker skin may need more. I personally need 5,000 international units a day to maintain my vitamin D levels between 50 and 60. And that's because partially skin color, partially I have some mutations around vitamin D, some genetic changes that impair vitamin D. So I found through supplementation and, and testing that that's what I need and my levels stay between 50 and 60, which to me is around that ideal range. I want people between 40 and 60. I don't want people much higher than that. I don't want people lower than that to be optimal. I like between 40 and 60. So during the summer months when people are outdoors, do we still need to take that? Some people will, some people won't. It really depends on the situation and also depends on nutrition, 
depends on their magnesium levels because magnesium is important for activating vitamin D. Um, we do get some vitamin D in certain foods we eat, like mushrooms, fatty fish, eggs. Some milk is fortified with vitamin D. Mm-hmm. So all of those can play a role in who needs to supplement and, and who doesn't. But again, the good news is it takes a whole lot of vitamin D for a pretty good amount of time before you start to see toxicity levels. All right. That, that is definitely good to know. Um, all right. And is this something that can interact with people's medication that they're taking if they are on something? I mean, is that something to, to clarify with your doctor? Yeah, you always want to check and see if there are possible interactions to your medications. A lot of people don't know that medications can interact with a lot of nutrients. They can either deplete nutrients or they can increase nutrient levels. And so this is something that you want to be aware of whenever you're starting a supplement. Now, for the most part, the only thing you're going to worry about is stuff that interacts with calcium, like diuretics or certain blood pressure medications. Those are the ones that you may see something But in all the years that I've been a doctor and a pharmacist, I really haven't seen a drug vitamin D interaction. Okay. That's definitely good to know. And you just, you just kind of uh, brought that up that, so were you a pharmacist, then you became a medical doctor and then you got your MBA. Tell us how your education worked. Cause I'm fascinated by this because my husband's a doctor and a lot of doctors don't know a whole lot about business, you know? I mean, they come out and they know a lot about medicine, but they don't know a lot about business. So I'm really interested that you got your MBA. So I'm curious about that, tell us. Yeah, I went to pharmacy school first. In pharmacy school, I figured out I wanted to be a medical doctor because I don't like knowledge gaps. Knowledge gaps bother me. And so I learned how you treat everything. I learned all kinds of great stuff about physiology and medication. I didn't know how you diagnosed anything. And that really bothered me. And so that's why I went to medical school. And then in medical school, I realized, well, there's gaps here. I was always more holistic because I was uh, an athlete, played sports in high school, played club sports in college, powerlifting team in college, that kind of thing. And so I was always really interested in exercise and nutrition. And I realized there were gaps there. So then I went and self-taught by reading hundreds of studies on nutrition and all these other stuff. And then I realized that you know, maybe one day I want to walk away from medicine completely. Well, my two degrees are both in medicine. So how am I going to do that? Mm-hmm. And I, I did some researching. I found out getting an MBA is the quickest way to reset your career. Because in two years, you can completely switch paths into something completely new. So I said, okay, let me get my MBA. And now it's pretty cool because I get to use all three degrees with what I do with my practice, my other businesses, the speaking I do, the consulting. So it's a perfect marriage of the education that I got. Well, and it's 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 important in your industry to understand all of that. I mean, there's some synergy there. So I like that. I think that's a, it's a great idea. And it's it, it again, it's something important that for doctors to think about, about knowing business and understanding business and what have you. And we have five children of our own. And I know we talk to our boys all the time about how important it is to understand the concept of business that you you really can't go wrong with a medical degree and a business degree. You know, they're, right. they're both important, equally important. Right. And part of the problem, this is a whole nother conversation for another day. Like what's wrong with healthcare. But part of the problem is you have hospital systems run by private equity and MBAs who have never put their hands on a patient. Mm. So there's a disconnect between the clinical side and then the business side. And really, we need people who are able to speak both languages. In my ideal world, the hospital CEO should still be putting hands on a patient once a week. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you you get disconnected. Medicine really is an art. And just like any other art, if you don't do it, or if you stop doing it, or if you've never done it, you don't understand the art that goes into medicine. It's more than X's and O's. It's more than just numbers. It's a whole process of being there with someone as they're going through, you know, oftentimes maybe the worst day of their life when they come and talk to sure. someone like me. Sure. And like you just said, it it's a practice. It's a continual learning process. And I have to applaud doctors like you who understand and know so much about nutrition because you guys aren't taught that in medical school. Right. And I think that's one of the biggest fundamental flaws in 
medical school education, that's starting to change. Now you're starting to see things pop up. There are kitchens being developed in medical schools where they're teaching people how to medicinally cook. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I do as a lifestyle medicine physician, I started to realize that I know a lot about medications, right? I have a clinical doctorate in medications. I know how they work. I know how they don't work. Medications for the large part, for most cr like chronic conditions, heart disease, diabetes, that kind of stuff, they're not going to save you. They're not, they're not going to overcome your habits, their, your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so I started to look at these things. And I started to find studies showing that for a whole host of things, things like exercise and nutrition and sleep and stress management are in some cases more powerful than medication. And I started thinking, wait a minute, what's the side effect of somebody meditating 20 minutes a day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. None. Right? None. So I, I started to realize that that is the type of medicine I wanted to practice and then fall back on your traditional allopathic stuff. If somebody's doing everything right, we're still not hitting our targets. Okay. Maybe I put you on one medication instead of six. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah. In long term, I mean, those medications can have very serious side effects. So, yeah, I mean, it's something to think about and to look at and to talk with your doctor. It's so so important. And, and that's why I really like the concept of vitamin D. I kind of think it's sort of like a gateway supplement for so many people because so many of us are low on it. So once you start there and, and I, I really believe in the like five and 10 percent concept. So, yeah, maybe meditating helps you five percent. Maybe vitamin D helps you five percent. Maybe exercising every day helps you 10 percent. Well, it, you add up all these things and maybe at the end of the day, you're 40 percent better. But mm -hmm. there are no side effects to that 40%. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a significant amount of progress for whatever ails you at the time. You are 100% correct. And the concept that you just stated is something that most docs don't understand, which is sad. And that's the Bayesian approach to analytics, right? You start adding up individual pieces and those mm -hmm. individual pieces sum a total. So you're right. There is, for most things, there's no single intervention that's going to get you from zero to 100% mm -hmm. for most things. It's a combination of all these sorts of things, exercise and meditation and, and sunlight and connection and walking in your purpose. Like all of these things have impacts on our health. And I think vitamin D is something that's a low hanging fruit. Vitamin D supplementation is dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. It's very cheap. And even the highest end quality supplements, it's still cheap. So we're talking something that's costing cents per day where most people are low and now we're seeing data come out like uh, a study that was just recently done. Most people would say, OK, this vitamin D stuff is great, but it doesn't prove causality. Right. So supplementing vitamin D hasn't really shown to be of, of benefit. And it just depends on the, the study. It depends on the parameters. It depends on, like I said, if their magnesium levels are low and you give them mm -hmm. vitamin, you can give them all the vitamin D you want to. It's not going to be activated. But what we do know is that people who are deficient in vitamin D have dramatically increased levels of mortality. So if you're deficient in vitamin D, one study that came out recently showed a 25% increase in the risk of cardiovascular mortality, a 16% risk, increased risk of cancer mortality, mortality is death, right? And a 96% increase in respiratory mortality for people who are deficient compared to people who aren't. Those numbers are significant. And the type of study this is, is a study that can prove causality. So to me, there is no argument now that if people are deficient in vitamin D, that it's important to get them at least to a point where they're not deficient. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, there's a difference between being not deficient and being optimal, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the way I practice, I don't want to just say, oh, you're not, you're not deficient and then call it a day, right? To me, that's like, oh, your house is only 10% on fire, you're fine. No, I want my house completely not on fire. I wanna be optimal, just not deficient is, is not enough. Well, and again, we know that vitamin D is a hormone and one hormone affects all other hormones in our body. And when we start, start talking about diabetes and insulin resistance and all these things that have to do with blood sugar issues, vitamin D, I would assume, plays into that. and that that has the potential to like if you start having blood sugar issues i mean you know people who are diabetic know you feel awful like i dealt with those for 
for a while until I kind of figured it out and changed my diet drastically. But I mean, you feel awful. Like when my doctor was like, your blood sugar is really high. We figured out what was wrong with you. I was like, thank God. Like I thought it was something terrible. I was that sick from blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So that again, kind of drives us back to this hormone concept of looking at something that's so simple. Right. And like you mentioned, vitamin D does play a role in metabolism. So the pancreas has vitamin D receptors. You know, our pancreas is what releases insulin. So vitamin D does play a role in insulin signaling and insulin sensitivity. Vitamin D also helps protect the pancreas. So vitamin D helps with regulating inflammation. There's acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation, like say I break my arm, I mm. want acute inflammation because I want immune cells and, and blood flow and pieces to come there to start regenerating, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's good. Chronic inflammation is bad, where inflammation is still continuing to linger when it doesn't need to be there, and that causes dysfunction and destruction. And so vitamin D is very important for helping to regulate the immune system. It actually helps in the uh, acute response, and it helps prevent the acute response from going chronic. So it's very important to not have an inflamed pancreas because an inflamed pancreas causes destruction of the cells that make insulin, and that further worsens insulin resistance. So it's a very important for that. It's very important for autoimmune diseases. One in five adults now have an autoimmune disease, up from one in six. And if you ask people 30 years ago if they knew someone with lupus, they'd probably tell you no. You ask someone now, hey, do you know someone with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis? Most people are going to say yes. Yeah. So true. that circle has closed. In vitamin D, we know that people who have things like Crohn's disease, things like ulcerative colitis, things like rheumatoid arthritis, things like multiple sclerosis, those things are associated with low vitamin D levels because of its impact on the immune system. So vitamin D also helps regulate our brain neuromodulators. So that's why you can see people with low vitamin D, there's association with, with abnormal and mood ir irregularities. So, you know, you start looking at all these things, and you're like, man, there's a whole bunch of association. How is this possible? Mm -hmm. Because like you mentioned, it's a hormone. And so it's important for numerous functions in the body. What are some other nutrients that are synergistic with this? You mentioned magnesium and calcium. When you go to the store, a lot of times you see the vitamin D plus K with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So vitamin K is another one of the fat soluble vitamins. So the fat soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K. And what you tend to see with these vitamins is, is something called the entourage effect, meaning that these vitamins all play a role with each other. And so because in nature, they tend to come together, right? And the sources that are, are let's, for instance, say uh, eggs, right? You can find uh, vitamin D in eggs. You can find some like vitamin K. You can find some. Um, and like cheese as well, they tend to come together. Uh, fatty fish are, are great sources of vitamin D. Same thing with uh, vitamin A. So there are things that are necessary. The most important things when you talk about vitamin D are magnesium because, like I said, vitamin D has this activation process. It starts in the skin, then it goes to the liver, then it goes to the kidneys. So, And by the time it reaches the kidneys, after that, that's when it's the active form. And magnesium is necessary to activate. And then vitamin K is important because specifically vitamin K2 helps pull the calcium into the bones. So vitamin D pulls it from the gut into the blood. Vitamin K pulls it from the blood into the bones. So that's important and they act synergistically. And then it just depends on you know, which specific function that you're looking at. But you know, a lot of times in the body, it's, just, it's not just one molecule, one cause. It's that molecule needs some helpers along the way to do its job. Okay. What about the sleep, sleep regulation? Because we know that's a big issue. A lot of people have trouble sleeping and winding down at night. I know being outside seems to help with that in a lot of cases. Is that also a vitamin D thing as well? No. So what happens with that? It's a related thing to... Um, to sunlight it's melatonin mm -hmm. so what happens when we go outside is two things especially if it's early in the morning 
you have these cells in your eyes that sense sunlight. And if it's early in the morning, usually before 10 a.m., it sets your 24-hour circadian clock. So it sets the rhythms in your body that are on a 24-hour cycle. And so what happens is that starts, it sends signals to your body. Your body actually uses temperature for this as the signal for that 24-hour clock. So your body warms up, starts going about its day. When you get sunlight, you make serotonin, you know, which we th tend to think of as one of the mood uh, neuromodulators, right? Serotonin tends to make us calm. As it, um, so that increases. And then at night, what happens is as the sun goes down and starts to get dark, you start making melatonin. Well, where's melatonin made from? Serotonin. So the sunlight helps increase serotonin levels, helps set your 24-hour clock. And then darkness starts when you, when it gets dark, and hopefully we're not using too bright of lights in the house all the time or staying up too late, then we're going to get proper melatonin signal to complete that 24-hour light-dark cycle. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Well, Dr. Harris, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such an important topic, something easy to fix and to really look at when it comes to health and nutrition. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you for having me, Lauren.